Even Trix's its enemies were forced to admit the saying that Canada City was the bank, and the bank was Trixit. Perhaps this had something to do with an excited meeting of the directors of the new mill, when the president told him that he had been selected to undertake the difficult and delicate mission of discovering the whereabouts of Montagu Trixit, and, if possible, procuring an interview with him, he was a what had the new mill, which had always kept itself aloof from the bank and its methods, to do with the disgraced manager. He was still more astonished when the president added bluntly, they do not appear on the books, but if he chooses to declare them as assets of the bank, it's a bad thing for us. If he is bold enough to keep them, he may be willing to make some arrangement with us to carry them on. If he has got away or committed suicide, as some say, it's for you to find the whereabouts of the securities and get them. He is said to have been last seen near the summit. You understand our position. Masterton did with suppressed disgust. But he was young, and there was the thrill of adventure in this. I will go, he said quietly. We thought you would. You must take the upstage tonight. Come again and get your final instructions. By the way, you might get some information at Trixit's house. You or er are acquainted with his daughter, I think, which makes it quite impossible for me to seek her for such a purpose said Masterton coldly. A few hours later he was on the coach. As they cleared the outskirts of the town, they passed two Chinamen plodding sturdily along in the dust of the highway. Mr. Masterton started from a slight doze in the heavy, lumbering mountain wagon which had taken the place of the smart Concord coach that he had left at the last station. The scenery, too, had changed. The four horses threaded their way through rocky defiles of stunted larches and hardy brush with here and there open patches of shrunk. Yet at the edge of declivities he could still see through the rolled-up leather curtains the valley below bathed in autumn, the glistening rivers half spent with the long summer draught, and the green slopes rolling upward, at times a drifting haze, always imperceptible from below, veiled the view. A chill wind blew through the vehicle, and made the steel sledge runners that hung beneath the wagon a few rude stations, half blacksmith shops, half grocery, marked the deserted but well-worn road, a long, narrow packer, the rough sheepskin jackets which these men wore over their characteristic blue blouses and their heavy leggings were a new revelation to Masterton, accustomed to the thinly clad coolie of the mines. They seemed a distinct race. I never knew those chaps get so high up, but they seem to understand the cold, he remarked. The driver looked up and ejaculated his disgust and his tobacco juice at the same moment. I reckon they were everywhere in California where you want em and where you don't. You take my word for it, a forlong California will have to reckon that she generally don't want em, if a white man has, with a race tied up together in a language ye can't understand, ways that no feller knows, from their praying to devils, swap in their wives, and they groped along through the woods where nobody could see em, coccolating to come down with a rush on the camp, over two miles away. And nobody did see em, only one Chinaman walked they met a mile from the camp, burn and punk to his joss or devil, and he scooted away just in the contrary direction. Well, Sir, when they waltzed into that camp, darn my skin, if there was a Chinaman there, or as much as a grain of rice to grab, somebody had warned him well. One of them noticed that there was some of them bits of tissue paper slips that they toss around at funerals lying along the road near the camp, and another remembered that the Chinaman they met on the hill tossed a Well, sir, the wind carried just enough of that paper straight down the hill into that camp ten minutes afore they could get there, to give them Chinamen warning, whatever it was. Fact, all the passengers turned by one accord and looked out. The file of Chinamen under observation had indeed turned, and was even then moving rapidly away at right angles from the road. Got some signal, you bet, said the driver. Some yellow paper or piece Oh, Joss, stick in the road. What? The remark was addressed to the passenger who had just placed his finger on his lip. 
and indicated a stolid-looking Chinaman, overlooked before, who was sitting in the... Oh, he be darned, said the driver impatiently. He is no account. He's only the laundryman from Rocky Canyon. I'm talking of the Cooley gang. But here the conversation flagged, and the air growing keener. The flaps of the leather side curtains were battened down. Masterton gave himself up to conflicting reflections. The information that he had gathered was meager and unsatisfactory, and he could only trust to luck and circumstance to fulfill his mission. The first glow of adventure having passed, he was uneasily conscious that the mission was not to his taste. The pretty, flushed but defiant face of Sissy that afternoon haunted him. He had not known the immediate cause of it, but made no doubt that she had already heard the news of her father's disgrace when he met her. He regretted now that he hadn't spoken to her, if only a few formal words of sympathy. He had always been half tenderly amused at her frank conceit and her airs, the innocent, undisguised pride of the country belle, so different from the hard aplomb of the city girl. And the contempt he had for the father had hitherto shown itself in tolerant pity for the daughter, so proud of her father's position and what it brought her, in the revelation that his own directors had availed themselves of that father's methods and the ignoble character of his present mission, he felt a stirring of self-reproach. What would become of her? Of course, frivolous as she was, she would not feel the keenness of this misfortune like another, nor yet rise superior to it. She would succumb for the present, to revive another season in a dimmer glory elsewhere. His critical, cynical observation of her had determined that any filial affection she might have would be merged and lost in the greater deprivation of her position. A sudden darkening of the landscape below, and a singular opaque whitening of the air around them, aroused him from his thoughts. The driver drew up the collar of his overcoat and laid his whip smartly over the backs of his cattle. The air grew gradually darker, until suddenly it seemed to disintegrate into invisible gritty particles that swept through the wagon. Presently these particles became heavier, more perceptible, and polished like small shot, and a keen wind drove them stingingly into the faces of the passengers, or the snow forced itself through the smallest crevice. We'll get over this when once we've passed the bend. The road seems to dip beyond, said Masterton cheerfully from his seat beside the driver. The driver gave him a single scornful look, and turned to the passenger who occupied the seat on the other side of him. I don't like the look o' things down there, but if we are stuck, we'll have to strike out for the next station, said Masterton, as the wind volleyed the sharp snow pellets. Look indeed between the volleys. Masterton could see that the road was perfectly bare and windswept and except slight drifts and banks beside outlying bushes and shrubs, which even where these mysterious snow pellets went to puzzled and confused him, they seemed to vanish as they had appeared into the air about them. I'd make a straight rush for the next station, said the other passenger confidently to the driver. If we restuck, we were that much on the way. If we turn back now, we'll have to take the grade anyway when the storm's over, and neither you nor I know when that'll be. It may be only a squall just now, but it's getting rather late in the season. Just pitch in and drive all ye know. The driver laid his lash on the horses, and for a few moments the heavy vehicle dashed forward in violent conflict with the storm. At times the elastic hickory framework of its dome lather roof swayed and bent like the ribs of an umbrella. At times it seemed as if it would be lifted bodily off. At times the whole interior, but presently, to Masterton's great relief, the interminable level seemed to end, and between the whitened blasts he could see that the road was descending. Again the horses were urged forward, and at last he could feel that the vehicle began to add the momentum of its descent to its conflict with the storm. The blasts grew less violent, or became only the natural resistance of the air to their dominant rush. With the cessation of the snow volleys and the clearing of the atmosphere, the road became more strongly defined as it plunged downward to a terrace on the mountain flank, several hundred feet below. 
Presently they came again upon a thicker growth of bushes, and here and there a solitary fir. The wind died away. The cold seemed to be less bitter. Masterton, in his relief, glanced smilingly at his companions on the box, but the driver's mouth was compressed as he urged his team forward, and the other passenger looked. They were now upon the level terrace, and the storm apparently spending its fury high up and behind them. But in spite of the clearing of the air, he could not but notice that it was singularly dark. What was more singular, the darkness seemed to have risen from below, and to flow in upon them as they descended. A curtain of profound obscurity, darker even than the mountain wall at their side, shut out the horizon and the valley below. But for the temperature, Masterton would have thought a thunderstorm was closing in upon them. An odd feeling of uneasiness crept over him. A few fitful gusts now came from the obscurity. One of them was accompanied by what seemed a flight of small startled birds crossing the road ahead of them. A second larger and more sustained flight showed his astonished eyes that they were white, and each bird an enormous flake of snow. For an instant the air was filled with these disks. In five minutes the ground was white with it, the long road gleaming out ahead in the darkness. The roof and sides of the wagon were overlaid with it as with a coating of plaster of Paris. In five minutes more the steaming backs themselves were blanketed with it. The arms and legs of the outside passengers pinioned to the seats with it, and the arms of the driver kept free only by instant. It was no longer snowing. It was snowballing. It was an avalanche out of the slopes of the sky. The exhausted horses floundered in it. The clogging wheels dragged it in it. The vehicle at last plunged into a billow of it and stopped. The bewildered and half-blinded passengers hurried out into the road to assist the driver to unship the wheels and fit the steel runners in their axles. But it was too late. By the time the heavy wagon was converted into a sledge, it was deeply embedded in wet and clinging snow. The narrow, long-handled shovels borrowed from the prospector's kits were powerless before this heavy, half-liquid impediment. At last the driver, with an oath, relinquished the attempt, and, unhitching his horses, collected the passengers and led them forward by a narrower and more sheltered trail toward the... The led horses broke a path before them. The snow fell less heavily, but it was nearly an hour before the straggling procession reached the house, and the snow-coated and exhausted past... The driver had vanished with his team into the shed. Masterton's fellow passenger on the box seat after a few whispered words to the landlord, also disappeared. I see you've got Jake Poole with you, said one of the barroom loungers to Masterton, indicating the passenger, who had just left. I reckon he's here on the same fool business. Masterton looked his surprise and mystification. Jake Poole? The deputy sheriff repeated the other. I reckon he's here pretending to hunt for Montagu Trixit like the San Francisco detectives that came up yesterday. Masterton with difficulty repressed a start. He had heard of Poole, but did not know him by sight. I don't think I understand, he said coolly. I reckon you were a stranger in these parts, returned the lounger, looking at Masterton curiously. If you weren't, You'd know that about the last man San Francisco or Canada City wanted to catch his Monty Trixit. He knows too much and they know it. But they've got to keep up a show chase, a kind o' circus ridin' up here to satisfy the stockholders. You bet that Jake Poole has got his orders they might kill him to shut his mouth, if they got an excuse, and he made a fight. But he ain't no such fool. No, sir, why? The sickest man you ever saw was that director that came up here with a detective when he found that Monty hadn't left the state. Then he is hiding about here, said Master. T the man paused, lowered his voice, and said, I wouldn't swear he wasn't a mile from where we were talking. Now, why, they do allow that he's taken a drink at this very bar since the news came, and that there's a hoss kept handy in the stable already saddled just to tempt him if he was inclined to scoot. That ain't no good if he has, as they say he has, papers stowed away with a friend that would frighten some mighty particular men out o' oh, their boots. 
returned the first speaker. But he's got his spies, too. And there ain't a man that crosses the divide as ain't spotted by them. The officers brag about having put a cordon around the district, and yet they've just found out that he managed to send a telegraphic dispatch from Black Rock Station right under their noses. Why, only an hour, or so arter the detectives and the news arrived here, there came along one o' them emigrant teams from Pike, and the driver said that a smart-looking chap, and the description the teamster gave just fitted tricks it to a T. Well, the information was give so public-like that the detectives had to make a rush over thar, and be gosh, although there wasn't a soul past them but a file of Chinese coolies, when they got there they but he had at once grasped the situation that seemed now almost providential for his inexperience and his mission. The man he was seeking was within his possible reach, if the story he had heard was true. The detectives would not be likely to interfere with his plans, for he was the only man who really wished to meet the fugitive. The presence of Poole made him uneasy, though he had never met the man before. Was it barely possible that he was on the same mission on behalf of others. If what he heard was true, there might be others equally involved with the absconding manager. But then the spies, how could the deputy sheriff elude them, and how could he? He was turning impatiently away from the window when his eye caught sight of a straggling file of Chinamen bracing the storm. A sudden idea seized him. Perhaps they were the spies in question. He remembered the driver's story. A sudden flash of intuition made him now understand the singular way the file of coolies which they met had diverted their course after passing the wagon. They had recognized the deputy on the box. Stay, there was another Chinaman in the coach. He might have given them the signal. He glanced hurriedly around the room for him. He was gone. Perhaps he had already joined the file he had just seen. His only hope was to follow them, but how? and how to do it quietly, the afternoon was waning. It would be three or four hours before the down coach would arrive, from which the driver, now, if ever, was his opportunity. He made his way through the back door, and found himself among the straw and chips of the stable yard and wooched. Still uncertain what to do, he mechanically passed before the long shed which served as temporary stalls for the steaming wagon horses. At the further end, to his surprise, was a tethered musting ready saddled and bridled the opportune horse left for the fugitive, according to the lounger's story. Masterton cast a quick glance around the stable. It was deserted by all save the feeding animals. He was new to adventures of this kind, or he would probably have weighed the possibilities and consequences. He was ordinarily a thoughtful, reflective man, but like most men of intellect, he was also imaginative and superstitious, and this crowning accident of the providential situation in which there would also be a grim irony in his taking this horse for such a purpose. He again looked and listened. There was no one within sight or hearing. He untied the rope from the bit ring, leaped into the saddle, and emerged cautiously from the shed. The wet snow muffled the sound of the horse's hoofs. Moving round to the rear of the stable so as to bring it between himself and the station, he clapped his heels into the mustings' flanks and dashed into the open. At first he was confused and bewildered by the half-hidden boulders and snow-shrouded bushes that beset the broken ground, and dazzled by the still-driving storm. But he knew that they would also divert attention from his flight, and beyond, he could now see a white slope slowly rising before him, near whose crest a few dark spots were crawling in fire. They were the Chinamen he was seeking. He had reasoned that when they discovered they were followed they would, in the absence of any chance of signaling through the storm, detach one of their number to give the alarm. Him he would follow. He felt his revolver safe on his hip. He would use it only if necessary to intimidate the spies. For some moments his ascent through the wet snow was slow and difficult, but as he advanced, he felt a change of temperature corresponding to that he had experienced that afternoon on the wagon coming down. The air grew keener, the snow drier and finer. He kept a sharp lookout for the moving figures, and scanned the horizon for some indication of the prospector's deserted hut. 
Suddenly the line of figures he was watching seemed to be broken, and then gathered together as a group. Had they detected him? Evidently they had, for, as he had expected, one of them had been detached, and was now moving at right angles from the party towards the right. With a thrill of excitement he urged his horse forward. The group was far to the left, and he was nearing the solitary figure. But to his astonishment, as he approached the top of the slope he now observed another figure, as far to the left of the group as he was to the right, and that figure he could see, even at that. He halted for a better observation. For an instant he thought it might be the fugitive himself, but as quickly he recognized it was another man, the deputy. It was he whom the Chinaman had discovered. It was he who had caused the diversion and the dispatch of the vedette to warn the fugitive. His own figure had evidently not yet been detected. His heart beat high with hope. He again dashed forward after the flying messenger, who was undoubtedly seeking the prospector's ruined hut and tricks it. But it was no easy matter. At this elevation the snow had formed a crust, over which the single Chinaman, a lithe young figure skimmed like a skater, while Masterton's horse crashed though it into unexpected depth. Again, the runner could deviate by a shorter cut, while the horseman was condemned to the one-half obliterated trail. The only thing in Masterton's favor, however, was that he was steadily increasing his distance from the group and the deputy sheriff, and so cutting off their connection with the messenger. But the trail grew more and more indistinct as it neared the summit, until at last it utterly vanished. Still he kept up his speed toward the active little figure, which now seemed to be that of a mere boy skimming over the frozen snow. Twice a stumble and flounder of the musting through the broken crust ought to have warned him of his recklessness, but now a distinct glimpse of a low, black and shanty, the prospect, the distance was lessening between them. He could see the long pigtail of the fugitive standing out from his bent head, when suddenly his horse plunged forward and downward. In an awful instant of suspense and toilet, such as he might have seen in a dream, he felt himself pitched headlong into suffocating depths, followed by a shock, the crushing weight. How long he lay there thus he never knew. With his returning consciousness came this strange twilight again, the twilight of a dream. He was sitting in the new church at Canada City, as he had sat the first Sunday of his arrival there, gazing at the pretty face of Sissy Trixit in the pew opposite him, and wondering who she was. Again he saw the startled, awakened light that came into her adorable eyes, the faint blush that suffused her cheek as she met his inquiring gaze, and the conscious, half-conceited. This was followed by what seemed to be the crashing in of the church roof, a stifling heat succeeded by a long, deadly chill. But he knew that this last was all a dream, and he tried to struggle to his feet to see Sissy's face again, a reality that he felt would take him out of this horrible trance, and he called. He came back to life with a sharp tingling of his whole frame as if pierced with a thousand needles. He knew he was being rubbed, and in his attempts to throw his torturers aside, he saw faintly by the light of a flickering fire that they were Chinamen, and he was lying on the floor of a room. With his first movements they ceased, and, wrapping him like a mummy in warm blankets, dragged him out of the heap of loose snow with which they had been rubbing him, toward the fire that glowed upon The stinging pain was succeeded by a warm glow. A pleasant languor, which made even thought a burden, came over him, and yet his perceptions were keenly alive to He heard the Chinaman mutter something and then depart, leaving him alone. But presently he was aware of another figure that had entered, and was now sitting with its back to him at a rude table, roughly extemporized from a packing box, apparently engaged in writing. It was a small Chinaman, evidently the one he had chased. The events of the past few hours, his mission, his intentions, and every incident of the pursuit flashed. Where was he? What was he doing here? Had Trixit escaped him? In his exhausted state he was unable to formulate a question which even then he doubted if the Chinaman could understand. So he simply watched him lazily, and with a certain kind of fascination, 
until he should finish his writing and turn round. His long pigtail, which seemed ridiculously disproportionate to his size, the pigtail which he remembered had streamed into the air in his flight, had partly escaped from the discovery. But what was singular, it was not the wiry black pigtail of his Mongolian fellows, but soft and silky, and as the firelight played upon it, it seemed of a shining chestnut brown. The figure instantly turned. He started. It was Sissy Trixit. There was no mistaking that charming, sensitive face, glowing with health and excitement, albeit showing here and there the mark of the pigment with which it had been stained. A little of it had run into the corners of her eyelids and enhanced the brilliancy of her eyes. He found his tongue with an effort. What are you doing here? He asked with a faint voice and a fainter attempt to smile. That's what I might ask about you, she said pertly, but with a slight touch of scorn. But I guess I know as well as I do about the others. I came here to see my father, she added defiantly. And you are the, the one I chased, yes, and I'd have outrun you easily, even with your horse to help you, she said proudly, only I turned back when you went down into that the young girl took up a glass of whiskey ready on the table and brought it to him. Take that. It will fetch you all right in a moment. Popper says no bones are broken. Masterton waved the proffered glass. Your father, is he here? He asked hurriedly, recalling his mission. Not now. He's gone to the station to fetch my clothes, she said with a little laugh. To the station repeated Masterton, bewildered. Yes, she replied, to the station. Of course you don't know the news, she added, with an air of girlish importance. They've stopped all proceedings against him, and he's as free as you are. Masterton tried to rise, but another groan escaped him. He was really in pain. Sissy's bright eyes softened. She knelt beside him, her soft breath fanning his hair, and lifted him gently to a sitting position. Oh, I've done it before, she laughed as she read his wonder, with his gratitude in his eyes. The horse was already stiff, and you were nearly so by the time I came up to you and got, she laughed again, the other Chinaman, to help me pull you out of that hole. I know I owe you my life. It was lucky I was there, she returned naively. Perhaps lucky you were chasing me. I'm afraid that of the many who would run after you I should be the least lucky, he said with an attempt to laugh. I guess that's what they all came here for, except one, but it didn't keep them from believing and saying he was a thief behind his back. Yet they all wanted his confidence, she added bitterly. Masterton felt that his burning cheeks were confessing the truth of this. You accepted one, he said hesitatingly. Yes, the deputy sheriff. He came to help me, you, yes. Me, a coquettish little toss of her head added to his confusion. He threw up his job just to follow me, without my knowing it, to see that I didn't come to any harm. He saw me only once, too, at the house when he came to take possession. He said he thought I was clear of grit to risk everything to find father, and he said he saw it in me when he was there, that's how he guessed where I was gone when I ran away and followed me. But how did you get here? She slipped down on the floor beside him with an unconscious movement that her masculine garments only made the more quaintly girlish, and clasping her knee with both hands. It will shock a proper man like you. I know, she began demurely, but I came alone with only a Chinaman to guide me. I got these clothes from our laundryman, so that I shouldn't attract attention. I would have got a Chinese lady's dress, but I couldn't walk in their shoes. She looked down at her little feet encased in wooden sandals, and I had a long way to walk. But even if I didn't look quite right to Chinamen, no white man was able to detect the difference. You passed me twice in the stage, and you didn't know me. I traveled night and day, most of the time walking and being passed along from one Chinaman to another, or, when we were alone, being slung on a pole between two coolies like a bale. I ate what they could give me, for I dared not go into a shop or a restaurant. 
I couldn't shut my eyes in their dens, so I stayed awake all night. Yet I got ahead of you and the sheriff, though I didn't know at the time what you were after, she added presently.